telling you that eating plant-based foods is healthy, no surprise. There's no light bulb that goes off in your head uh, when I say that. But I want to uh, give you a perspective that will actually hopefully open your mind to some new thinking. And that is that um, uh, in the quest to develop new medications, uh, biopharmaceuticals, um, we've actually uh, also in parallel been coming up with lots of innovations of foods. And some of these things you will recognize, plant-based meats, you can grow meat in a tissue culture, you can print your food, uh, there's uh, microbiomics, precision nutrition, biosensors you can plant on your teeth, and lots of chefs are innovating things as well. But this, these innovations have been, uh, which are now relatively new in food, have been going on in the biotech and pharmaceutical world for decades. And that's really where my background is. I, I started out by trying to take a look at targets and disease that we could actually develop biotechnology uh, solutions for so that you can pinpoint a defect and then you can actually design a, a homing missile to be able to actually spear uh, and hit the bullseye and spear it right down the, the center. And that's really biotechnology. Now, in the last 20 years, biotechnology has produced more than 800 different types of treatments that have been approved by the FDA. These treatments all have been through cell, studied in cells, animals, they've been studied in humans, um, they've been looked at for safety, they've looked at dosing, they've looked at um, uh, trying to isolate uh, what types of diseases they're used for, for interventions, they've had endpoints, they've had critical looks of safety, and then they've actually had committees sitting around to review whether or not the body of evidence um, merited an FDA approval. And then, of course, it was safe. Now, nobody talks about foods being approved in this way, even though it's called the Food and Drug Administration. FDA's role for food has been traditionally mostly focused on safety. And thank goodness that they actually do that. Um, but think about food efficacy. Who's going to be thinking about that? So that's what I want to introduce to you, because you, it's possible to study food as medicine, not just in a hand wavy, slogany sort of way, but literally what I've done is to study food using the same uh, preclinical and clinical systems as we use to study uh, and develop drugs. And that's actually, uh, I think, where the um, light bulb should be going off when I show you this. So before we talk about food, let's talk about how actually the body responds to things. Let's talk about biotechnology. There is a whole field of angiogenesis tr treatments aimed at the circulation, uh, regenerative medicine, uh, injecting stem cells. Um, DNA modification is gene therapy. Uh, microbiome is now being is a hot area um, to looking being looked at by innovators. And immunotherapy actually is one of the biggest breakthroughs uh, for the treatment of cancer. In fact, it won the Nobel Prize um, in 2018. So each of these areas I have personally worked in on the biopharmaceutical drug development technology side of things. So I know a lot about taking um, a, a drug, a chemical uh, or biological, looking at the systems you'd use to test it in, and then actually critically looking at, can we actually show an effect? Well, about 10 years ago, uh, while I was doing this, I realized that it was something pretty amazing because as a physician, my patients would um, always um, want to know what they could do to treat their disease. And I would write prescriptions and do referrals sometimes get them into a clinical trial. But then before they left the office, they'd always ask me, hey doc, one more thing, what can I do for myself? What should I eat? And I realized that most physicians have, do, do not have education in nutrition or have very, very little education in nutrition. And I felt that was wrong. I didn't have, I, I, had, I had so many other uh, responses I could offer my patients and thoughts I offer my patients, but when it came to nutrition, I knew almost nothing. And so that's when I actually went back to realize that a lot of what we know about the body has come out of our drug development efforts. There's a lot of research that goes on in this space. That's what the NIH generally funds research um, in order to, in, in, with the quest of actually develop, developing treatments or cures. But I realized that, you know, while you could take some a researcher and they can go online and order an overnight uh, some chemotherapy that would arrive the next day and they could take a spoonful of that and put it into their experimental system. And within a few days or maybe even a few hours, you would know if that chemical that you ordered could actually be useful against cancer or some other disease. If you picked up the phone and called a pizza or a salad to be delivered to your, um, uh, to your lab and asked that same researcher to study it, um, study, the, study the, the onions or the peppers or the mushrooms um, or the tomato sauce, there will be no way for that researcher that might be brilliant in, in studying um, cancer research 
would have no way of actually investigating what the activity was. And so that's really what I set out to do. Use the tools of biotechnology to really begin studying food so that food as medicine really becomes uh, its own namesake. Uh, we're actually studying it in, in a sophisticated way. So now I wanna share with you what we know uh, about these systems. I'm gonna start with angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the growth of blood vessels in the body. Um, uh, we've got 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels um, in our body. And, uh, uh, and each of them takes oxygen from our lungs that we breathe um, and nutrition that we actually eat and swallow. Uh, deli- these, these, this network delivers these elements to every single cell in our body. So this is really literally our lifelines uh, in our body. And we, our body has to protect um, uh, our health by making sure that these vessels are functioning in perfect order. That means that we have just the right number of blood vessels, not too few or tissues will die, not too many, or the blood vessels will start to feed disease tissues like cancer uh, and other, and other in, uh, inflammatory diseases as well. And so our body has the ability to keep ev- all the blood vessels in perfect balance, in perfect check. And while drugs can punch through and all, all the, uh, and they can smoke and, and get rid of a whole bunch of blood vessels, or you can overgrow blood vessels, as it turns out, um, with food, you can't overgrow or undergrow. It's just basically like a gardener that basically uh, trims the hedges to the perfect height every single time. And that's a really important thing to think about because when we eat foods, um, we're actually either pruning or growing blood vessels as well. If we don't have enough blood vessels, you have a whole series of ischemic diseases that can result. Um, and if you actually have too many blood vessels, those blood vessels can feed diseases as well. So here, when the balance in the body is upset, the balance of angiogenesis, which defends our health, when that defender is damaged, you would have too, too few or too many blood vessels and you wind up having disease. And where do we see this the most? By the way, these are these yellow stars are exactly where they're already FDA approved um, treatments. Uh, and we wanna aim towards that healthy middle. Um, let me show you first an example where we can actually inhibit angiogenesis or stop extra blood vessels. Turns out the cancers hijack blood vessels because all cancers started as harmless cells in our body. In fact, every one of us who are watching um, uh, uh, this, uh, um, this video actually has microscopic cancers growing like pimples in our body. It's just natural. We have trillions of cells that are dividing. Some of them are going to make mistakes. Most of those microscopic cancers will be detected by the immune system and won't be able to grow because they don't have a blood supply. But when they actually figure out how to grow a blood supply, um, then the blood vessels can grow up. And it turns out, and this is research I've done, once a blood vessel touches a microscopic cancer, that tumor can grow 16,000 times in only two weeks. And the same blood vessels that are feeding the cancer can allow them to escape into the circulation. So anti-angiogenics is so cutting off the blood supply to a tumor is a important way. Starving the cancer is a new way to actually treat cancer. And so this is actually how we discovered and tested those drugs that are FDA approved for angiogenesis inhibition or starving cancers. On the left, you're looking at a ring from an eagle's eye point of view of an aorta. That's the biggest blood vessel in the body. So this is actually um, in a a laboratory in an animal system. And the aorta inside that ring um, are blood vessel cells that normally sit quietly. But once you drop um, uh, some of the stuff the tumors release, fertilizer, you can kind of see this white starburst of, of blood vessels are all growing up. In fact, if you were to inject one of those little hair fine um, uh, strands on one side with ink, ink will flow all the way through it and come out the other side because it's actually a blood vessel network. Now, if you actually put a drug and here on the right-hand side, you can see it's a drug called TNP-470. You slam down all those blood vessels, they can't grow. And this is how cancer therapies to starve cancers are developed because you now know that you can cut off the blood supply uh, to, a, to a tumor. And in fact, that same drug that I just showed you was tested in a patient. This is a patient, a CT scan of chest CT of a patient. The black areas are the lungs, the white um, uh, uh, oval in the middle is the heart. Um, and, uh, uh, and you can kind of see on the left-hand side, inside those black um, uh, half moon uh, like uh, areas um, are these little white spicules. That's metastatic cervical cancer. Okay, cervical cancer in a, in a 40-year-old woman who spread, spread to her lungs, metastatic disease, and she got that same drug that I showed you on the right-hand side of that aortic ring where it shut down all the blood vessels, and 18 weeks later, you can see very clearly that by starving the tumor, by cutting off the blood supply, you prevent it from growing. So this is actually um, a very exciting thing. It's led to a whole new 
frontier of cancer therapy called anti-angiogenic therapy. I've been involved with this for the last 25 years. But now let me actually show you that question that I asked. Well, what if we weren't testing a drug? What if we were testing something from the garden or the farmer's market? So now let me show you the same tool that we use. Again, blood vessels that if you drop what tumors throw in there, they form the starburst. Now, instead of drugs, let's drop some stuff that we can extract from food. In this case, soy. The phytoestrogen, phytochemical that actually comes from soy actually shuts down all of the blood vessel growth. And by the way, there are no estrogen receptors in this system. So this is a non-estrogenic effect. Um, uh, and you can kind of see how powerful uh, as soy uh, genistein is as an anti-angiogenic substance. Well, there's this urban legend out there that women who want to avoid breast cancer should be stay as far away from soy as possible because of the phytoestrogen. Well, it turns out the, phy the phytoestrogen, the plant estrogen, looks nothing like human estrogen. And in fact, the plant estrogen blocks the human estrogen. It's kind of like mother nature's tamoxifen. And so that whole er uh, idea uh, about avoiding soy is well-intentioned. It's kind of the right idea, but the wrong interpretation of the science. So what I've shown you here is that you can actually shut down angiogenesis, but the real question is, does this actually work in people? And here's a study of 5,000 women in Shanghai. It's called the Shanghai Breast Cancer um, Survival Study. And they actually studied soy intake as food, soy foods in 5,000 women who already had breast cancer, most vulnerable population. Listen, if, if, this, if soy was gonna hurt you, it was gonna really hurt badly um, in women who already had breast cancer. They looked at breast cancer survivors and they looked at how much soy they ate. And they found that the, those women who ate more soy had an almost 30% decreased risk of death from their breast cancer. And in terms of the women who actually survived breast cancer, if they, those that had more soy also had a lower risk of recurrence, less blood vessels feeding the cancers to come back. Now, how much soy did you actually have to take? Well, it turns out you only needed about 10 grams of soy protein a day in order to be able to get this effect. And that's about as much soy as you get in one cup of soy milk. Now in Asia, there are so many different uh, forms of soy, fermented, non-fermented, uh, cooked, uh, uh, not raw. You know, um, we tend to, in America, have a relatively uh, limited repertoire. Maybe we have some tofu, maybe we have some soy milk, maybe we actually um, uh, have some, uh, 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 they make soy cheese. Um, but the reality is that there are many, many different types of soy uh, proteins that are out there. And so based on what I showed you with that, that 5,000 patient study, the skeptic would say, well, it's always good to show one case, but how do we know that's true? Maybe that was just chance in 5,000 people. Well, then when we do a meta-analysis and this is 14 studies, 14 different studies you can see stacked up on the left. And all of these studies looked at whether soy was um, caused more death or help to improve survival in breast cancer patients. And you can see very clearly in no study was there actually soy causing more death. In fact, in all the studies, it actually improved survival. And so again, this is where food as medicine is studied using evidence, using science. I showed you the preclinical laboratory work. I showed you some clinical trials. Now I showed you some meta-analyses. This is how you actually do food as medicine. At least this is one way to actually do food as medicine I'm working on. Now, there are lots of foods with anti-angiogenic activity. I wrote a book called Eat to Beat Disease um, that Ben introduced. Um, please feel free if you want to look at lists and lists and lists. More than 200 foods I wrote about. The, the, in this case, uh, this is a partial list of foods with anti-androgenic activity. And I talk about that. Let's talk br briefly about the foods that stimulate androgenesis so we can actually um, uh, help to counteract when we don't have enough blood vessels in the body, like in cardiovascular disease. And it turns out that barley and mushrooms and other foods that contain um, beta-D-glucan which um, actually is a soluble fiber that, that causes your body to upregulate, make more of natural fertilizer to grow blood vessels where it's needed. You need this for healing a wound. You need this recovering from a heart attack. You need this recover from a stroke. Now, this is actually the data from this research showing that if you actually um, uh, tied off the coronary artery of a lab animal and gave them a heart attack, if you fed them uh, uh, the, the, the chow, the rat chow in the lab, was made of, of pasta. The pasta wasn't made from wheat, it was made from barley and the barley had beta D glucan. You can kind of see in the bar graph that the, that the pasta eaters with beta, made from beta glucan, which stimulates blood vessels, actually generated more blood vessels. And you can kind of see in that brown staining 
um, uh, on the uh, 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 panel. Uh, on the right-hand side, it's PBBG is pasta made with beta-glucan. You can see there's more blood vessels growing. So this is an example of something oral in an animal model, the same type of animal model we use to study therapeutic angiogenesis drugs for in biotech development. And you can kind of see the results that we can actually get. Now, uh, uh, there's also a, a natural chemical called ursolic acid and foods have that. Um, it's often found in fruit peel. So apple peel, um, cranberry peel, um, uh, peel of grapes. Um, not always easy to eat fruit peel um, unless you have it as dried fruit, like in a trail mix, you can actually eat a lot of fruit peel that way. But um, fruit peel contains ursolic acid. And ursolic acid has been shown to help prompt the body to respond by um, creating a natural chemical called nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide not only causes vasodilation, it's the same substance that Viagra causes your body to produce bigger blood vessels, better blood flow. We know what Viagra does. And actually foods with ursolic acid will also help to dilate blood vessels. And that stimulates new blood vessels to actually grow. Now, actually when you feed animals that actually have their um, uh, femoral artery tied off and that's on the left, you can kind of see comparing, this is, the, uh, this is a rat left to right on that left-hand side, no blood flow. Look at the other leg um, uh, shown on the right side, hand side of the picture, red blood flow. There's a, in the middle is a tail good blood flow. Now, after three days of treatment with orsolic acid given by mouth orally, you can kind of see, that's derived from fruit peel, by the way, you can kind of see dilating the blood vessels, growing new blood vessels, and protecting this from ischemia or the lack of blood flow. So again, food is medicine. By the way, how do we know about these types of um, laboratory uh, animal assays? Because this is exactly what we use to try to develop treatments for ischemic limbs or peripheral arterial disease. This is These are gold standard um, uh, methodologies used for drug development. So that's my background. Um, and instead of testing drugs, we actually test natural chemicals. Those chemicals are coming from food. And that's really what the interesting thing is. So here's a whole list of foods with angiogenesis stimulating activity. And anybody who's interested, um, uh, if you come to my website, drdrwilliamlee.com, drwilliamlee.com, you can sign up. And I actually, uh, because the research keeps on going, I actually release information about new findings on angiogenesis and foods and health um, all the time. I also have been teaching a course, an online course about this um, uh, with the latest information as well.